Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, so we like to turn it off. Is the sound on? Uh, no. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to wrap up Space Saver. And after wrapping up Space Saver, we'll talk about Count Mitzkech and Bloom Filters because they're actually quite useful algorithms. And then look at a couple of properties. Alex, is your microphone on? Is it? Is your microphone on? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So just to recap how Space Saver works, it maintains this ordered list of key value pairs. The keys are basically the identities of the most frequent items and the values are the counters. And whenever a new item arrives that's not in the list, it evicts the key value pair with the smallest counter by overwriting its counter, uh, overwriting its key and incrementing its value. That's it. So this has a very well defined memory footprint and you can just go for it. Okay. Um, trick question. Um, suppose I have very long keys. So let's say the keys are for instance, you know, Shakespeare's sonnets or they are entire Facebook homepages, and let's assume that Facebook homepages are static, or they are just web pages, or they are other pieces of text. Okay. How can you avoid having to store that really long key? A hash, exactly. Okay, good. This was just a sanity check that, to make sure that, it, that everybody's really <laughs> picked up a few ideas during the class. Okay, so, and as far as the length of the hash is concerned, well, we all know by Bursley paradox that if I have n different keys, I need to have a hash range of order n squared. Okay, so basically double the number of bits. Which might explain why Amazon, for instance, is using 128-bit hash keys. So what you can do if at some point you're bored, um, you can think about, you know, the product of number of peoples in the people in the world times number of products times all possible times when you could purchase something which gives you, gives you some gigantic number you square that and you're a little bit below 128 a uh, bit so there's a good reason to believe that they probably had stuff like this in mind when they designed their hash keys okay so if you're bored just at some point do this. Uh, maybe not in class. Okay. Um, so the guarantees that you can get from, uh, from Space Saver are actually quite surprising. So let me just recap them and then we'll prove them one by one. The first thing is the error is bounded by uh, n over k. And that was simply due to the fact that the sum over n hat x over all x in this space saver is exactly n, right? So in other words, since at each step we increment by one, well, that's it. Secondly, we know that we have k bins. So therefore, it follows that the smallest bin, min over x, n hat x, is less equal than n over k. This is by pigeonhole principle. Okay. Now, the next thing that we know is that if we insert an element and it never leaves our counter again and it just stays there, the error for that element will not increase. That's just due to the fact that the only things that can increment that counter is if that particular key comes in. Or alternatively, if the key gets evicted and then something else increments and then it comes back. But once that counter is there, it stays. So that proves claim number six. It also shows why claim number two is correct. Namely, the smallest counter is really what matters. Because at any time, the largest error that I could ever make is the amount 
by we, basically is, is the amount of that smallest counter. So if you wanted to improve space saver, it's not a very smart idea to improve it this way, but you could improve it by simply storing which each with each key value pair the value of the counter when that key was inserted. If you don't want to do that, maybe you can just store log number of bits or something like that. So it's probably not going to cost you too much, but that will give you a convenient way of getting a tighter upper bound. Okay. Now, um, the other few things, namely claims three, four, and five, I'm going to go through in a bit more detail on the next few slides. But basically, claim number three tells us if the distribution, so let's look at a histogram, right? And I'm going to define F1K. Okay, if this is K, then this amount here is F1 superscript K. So it's basically the remainder of the distribution if I remove the K heaviest items. So we already saw that, you know, adding more of the really frequent ones isn't really going to mess up things. So it's only quite natural to ask, can I get a tighter bound on my counts by disregarding the heaviest of all items? And that's basically what this guarantee says. It says, well, you know, not only is the upper bound n over k, but it's basically the remainder. So rather than f1, which is n, we have f1k, but then it's only the remaining positions after the first k one. So it's n minus k that I'm really storing. OK. And then the quite surprising, but it's actually a very simple proof, as we'll see, we'll see that the rate that uh, space saver achieves is optimal. As in, there is no deterministic algorithm storing counters and doing other manipulations, which would be able to, store, to have a lower error than, well, basically space saver. And then the last thing that's quite nice is, so the count at the ith position majorizes the, a, the ith count, true count. So um, that's a statement that needs to be taken with a little bit of care. So let's say, for instance, in reality, cats are more frequent than dogs, right? But it just so happens that in our um, you know, space saver implementation, OK, sure, these are all upper bounds, I get this. And I get that the dogs are here and the cats are there. Now, what that theorem says is that this number here upper bounds the true number of that. So basically, in this case, it would mean n cat is greater or equal than n, n hat cat is greater or equal than n dog. And likewise, n hat dog would be greater than n cat. Right? So, in other words, if we can always fit the true histogram underneath the estimates. So the red guys are the estimates, the blue ones are the truth. OK. We're going to prove this now. But before that, so here's this really cool example from the Metavali Agarwal in Labadi paper. Um, and they basically compared their algorithm to what was the best, what were the best tools at the time. And basically theirs is this you know, dark solid blue box, and what you can see is it's fast, it has very good errors, and it's actually way better than all the others. So, I mean, no need to worry about the details, but it basically quite resoundingly tells you that if you want to get the K most frequent items, this is the algorithm to use. Okay. So now let's prove this. So the first part of the proof is that, well, OK, the error is upper bounded. We already have this. Um, so that's kind of easy. Because observing an element already in the list doesn't increase the error. We already have this. The optimality of the rate. OK. So now let's play a game. So let's say you are running a sketching algorithm with k distinct counters. 
and I'm giving you data. And I'm going to be evil to you. I'm going to feed you two sequences, SA and SB. And SA has the property that A was never observed up to some point. And then I'm going to ask you afterwards, how many times have you seen A? And furthermore, because you're running a deterministic algorithm, so I can engineer it this way, I'm assuming that at that time, when I'm asking that query, B isn't being tracked either. And since you only have K counters, I can always make it so that I pick something that you're not going to track. Okay? And for instance, I can give you, you know, K plus one I distinct items with the same frequency. You'll have to leave one of them out. There's nothing you can do. Now, since B isn't being tracked, the algorithm cannot really distinguish it from A. It doesn't know whether I've already seen it and it was just below the threshold or whether I haven't seen it at all. So it has to actually generate the same output for A and B. And since I can make the count of the seen versus the unseen item to be you know, as close as I want to N over K, so therefore I have order N over K error. So this is how you deterministically break the algorithm. Proving an optimality for the tails is a lot more tricky, and that's about two, three pages of work, and that's how you get a stock paper. So look at the Berinde et al. paper, I think from 2007 or so, uh, that has the details. But the really interesting part is already the optimality here, so the rest is essentially adding a substantial amount of derivation to the paper to get it into a very good theory conference. And it's solid math, but the algorithm is actually really the cool thing here. Okay, I'm not trying to put down theory, but the algorithm is way cooler. Um, now, the next thing is that any item with count nx larger than the smallest count must be in the array. Well, that's a very easy claim to show. Because, okay, let's assume that it isn't there. At some point, it must have been in the array. We know that at the point when it was in the array, its observed count, its estimated count was higher than its true count, right? Now, if that number was larger than the current smallest value, we have a contradiction. It cannot have gotten evicted. So the algorithm must have gone and evicted something else, so this way, this key must be there, right? So let's do cats and dogs again. So again, you know, and cat is greater than n dog, and n hat dog is actually the smallest value. Now, at some point, n hat cat is, well, is going, to, going to have been greater, well, that's of course greater than n cat, but this is now greater than n hat dog, so therefore, we can never have evicted n cat ever before at least not in the end. So it must be there. So yep? Is that the case, case that you just said, right? Yes. Uh, then why don't we, we for problem is subtractive, why don't we subtract k plus one, and then we only look at k and so that k plus one k plus one. You can do that, and that's exactly what gives you this even tighter bound, right? So that's part number three. That's, that's, that's exactly what you're asking for. It's basically track a little bit more, throw away the lowest terms, and for the rest you get even tighter guarantees. But then it can be extended further, right? If I want to track K, I would track two K. Yeah. And I would say cost K. So where is that optimal? Well, the issue is that at some point the algorithm gets slower and at some point you use too much memory. So the constraint is almost always going to be that you have to pay something for the resources that you use. And you know, you might actually not only have a single such counter. If it's just a single counter, it's kind of boring, but you might actually want to have that running over time. You might want to have localized ones. This thing might actually run on a switch. So, for instance, if you want to have a denial of service prevention mechanism on a switch, you would probably have a traffic counter on your switch. Now, those things are engineered to be super cheap. I mean, you know, you can basically buy a gigabit switch for, I don't know, 100, 200 bucks. So the processor in there is really lousy. I mean, basically, your cell phone is high-end by comparison. 
these are very, very heavily engineered ASICs that have very limited memory footprint. And so going from K to 2K is expensive. But right. Correct. Well, it's, well that, that's really application specific. And it's also distribution specific. So if you can assume that you have a small number of very heavy hitters and then otherwise next to nothing, then yes, tracking, uh, you, you know, you're not going to need that many bins. On the other hand, if you have a very uniform distribution, then you'll need more. On the other hand, for a very uniform distribution, you probably don't care that much about the heaviest hitters anyway. So there are other data structures that will do a slightly better job if you want to get answers for queries for all keys. Because this one basically just throws its arm up in the air and says, well, I don't know if it's not in the top K. And so I'll show you the count min sketch uh, as the next sketching algorithm. And that will give you answers back regardless. OK. So now the last part is exactly this property here that the position count majorizes the true count at that quantile. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go through the few cases that we could have. So if I want to find out what the count for item ni is, right? The, this item could either be not in my list, or it could be at the correct position, or it could be at a higher position, or it could be at a lower position, right? And those four cases I need to go through. If the item is not in the list, well, then I know that the smallest item in the list must be larger, so therefore it trivially holds, right? Because Let's say I have, you know, obviously I, I needs to be less than K. Otherwise, that claim doesn't make any sense. And so, therefore, I know that in, in hat I is going to be greater or equal than the largest, than the smallest estimate that my sketch returns. But that's, again, then larger than, you know, the true count, and so everything's good. Now, if the item is at some position I, where it should be, then it's also very easy, right? Because we already know that it's an upper that the estimates that I'm getting are an upper bound on the true counts. So this is trivially correct. Now let's assume that the item sits at a position somewhere below. Okay, so we have those positions. And this is I. And that's where I'm really finding it. So this is J. Now, I know that n hat i is greater equal than n hat j, which means that an i hat is clearly greater or equal than n i, which is what should, be, what should have been there. So this claim holds. Okay. The last thing that I need is the contradiction the other way around, right? So again, we have position i. And now we place it at some location J. So let's say, for instance, you know, this would be position four. So ideally, I'd have one, two, three, four, five, whatever. But what happens is that I have four at position two. So now let's make a cut here. What this means is that there has to be some element at position 4, well, some element at position 4 or below that's greater than 4, right? So basically, the 1, 2s, and 3s have to be at least at position 4 or below, because they have to, be, have to go somewhere. Now, I also know that the estimated counts upper bound the true count, so therefore, this inequality also holds. Right. Basically, there has to be another item further down the list that has a higher true count, and so therefore, uh, because the entire list is ordered, everything's correct. Okay, good. So, the last part 
is actually quite fun, namely these tighter bounds. So if you look at this again, right? Well, what we clearly have is that if I take the residual sum after the first k terms, then I know that since the first k terms have a estimated count that's greater or equal than their true count, the residual count for the rest has to be less equal than their true count, right? Because they must have stolen it from somewhere because all the counts have to sum up to n. So if the first part is larger, at some point it has to be smaller. I mean, in a way, the space saver is the extreme case thereof where after we go to position k, all the remaining counts are zero, right? So if I stop earlier, I know that the rest has to be less equal than the entire tail here. Okay. So furthermore, I also know that, well, the smallest element in there has to be at most as large as, well, the average over those residual bins because I have monotonicity. So essentially, this element here has to be at least as large as basically F1 K over, well, these are the remaining bins that I stored. This is where every, all this gets aggregated. So I get, basically, if this is n, n minus k. So in other words, I can now use exactly the strategy that we discussed before, namely, well, I design a slightly larger sketch. I throw away the smallest elements, and the rest is going to be even more accurate. This, by the way, is a common strategy for a lot of randomized algorithms. So for instance, one of the algorithms that we are probably going to get to quite a bit later, namely when you do linear algebra, so there's this very nice paper of Martins and Halco and Trop. It basically uses a random matrix multiplication to obtain a lower dimensional, lower rank, essentially estimate of what the image of the original matrix should be. And it uses that then to obtain a good estimate of the eigenspace. And what it does is it basically adds a few dimensions extra and throws them away in the end. And that allows you to get very good guarantees. So this, so this general strategy for a randomized algorithm of not using the very bottom of the barrel where you know, the uncertainty is very high, but throwing away the smallest terms will often let you get much higher, much better guarantees for the remainder of the problem. So keep that in mind. And if you see an algorithm that doesn't use this, well, maybe you can actually improve it this way. So basically, throw out the really questionable stuff at the bottom. The analysis may sometimes actually become easier if you have that. Because you now don't need to prove a bound for the worst guy anymore but let's say only the 10th verse guy. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, everything clear? Okay. Should I speed up a bit? Yes. Oh, the, the residual sum. Well, that's basically this guy here, right? That's the residual sum. Or rather the, well, Okay, so, so there, there are two residual sums, right? There's basically, so if these are all the, the actual counters, then this sum here is obviously less equal than this sum here because the first guys are larger. And by conservation of counts, since I didn't add any counts, therefore this one has to be smaller. So that's what I mean by residual sum. Hmm? Basically, the only thing that could have happened is that I would ha might have, um, you know, a uh, associated one of the infrequent terms with the, you know, frequent observations, and so that just means that the additive error for the rest would have been lower. And that's kind of nice. Hmm? 
And this is actually very good if I have power law type distributions because I can just go and keep the very, very frequent terms, for instance, in my memory, and then the less frequent terms I could put on disk, on a solid state drive. So this, by the way, is a rather, it's like a dead simple insight, but it actually helps you a lot. Okay. So we all know in power law distributions we have P of X is proportional to basically X plus A to the minus B. Right. So we'll get something of that form, right? And now you can basically ask, what's the size of this residual here? And this turns out to be order x to the minus b plus 1. That's just what you get by integrating you know, the density, so you just lose 1 degree. Okay. So now let's look at how a real computer behaves. So real computer has some weight CPU and you can quite conceivably get something like maybe 100 gigabytes per second throughput, probably more than that. So between 100 gigabytes and maybe 10, 10 times that, that's roughly what you can get on the CPU chip. If you want to get the latest numbers, probably go to an Antic. So then there's RAM. And there, we are talking about maybe something in the order of 10 gigabytes per second. Actually, it's a little bit more than that in practice. I think you're getting about 40 to 50, and it depends on how many memory banks you have and all the details. They're just talking orders of magnitude here. Then, we are going to solid state disk. And there, we are actually going to get something in the order of maybe maybe 500 megabytes a second on a high end. And then we go to disk. And there we have something in order of maybe 100 megabytes per second. This is burst reads. Furthermore, the latency here is something like 10 to the minus 9 seconds. For random access in memory, we're talking more in the order of 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 7. So we're talking in the order of 100 nanoseconds. For solid state, well, with command queuing and so on, by now getting 100,000 IOPS to half a million IOPS is, is a reasonable number, so we're talking about 10 to the minus 5. And then for a hard drive, well, if it's a really good hard drive, we're getting about maybe 1, in 20, one over 20. Okay. So what you can see is that you get about, you know, 100-fold increase in latency. Well, actually, between here and there, it's more than that. It's more like 1,000-fold, right? So then the obvious question is, you know, if you design a sketching service that, for instance, you know, would need to be able to get, you know, frequency counts and have it all well balanced, you know, how would you, how would you build this? What you can do is you keep the really, really frequent items here in RAM, and then the less frequent items on SSD, and the really infrequent ones you hit the hard drive. Now, if you only have to hit the hard drive, hard drive what, every one in a thousand times relative to SSD, the hard drive can keep up. If you hit the main memory 100 times more frequently than the SSD, the SSD can keep up, and so on. So that's how you can actually then, you know, if you have a power law distribution, really map this power law frequencies into the various bins. And this way, get an algorithm that's basically as fast as CPU in my memory while using a lot more of the cheap one. You're basically doing latency hiding. So your computer actually does this with its file system, right? Because there are different blocks on the hard drive that are differently frequently accessed. 
And if you switch the cache off, well, you, your computer gets very slow. But what it does is it just keeps the most frequent ones in main memory. And then if you have a hybrid hard drive, you basically have a bit of an SSD and a real hard drive, and it's doing that caching over again. And sometimes the implementation of those algorithms is um, not quite adequate. And then your computer crashes. OK. So this is just a small detour of why you really care about those tricks in practice, because it can save you a lot of money or you know, make your algorithm 10 to 100 times faster. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, there's a couple of other sketches, and they are more or less kind of the same idea as the one before, but just optimizing a different parameter. And the two most famous other ones are lossy counting and frequent, and they came all before Space Saver. And Space Saver, in a way, beats them all. The key difference between uh, those latter two, and Space Saver is that Space Saver basically says, I have a given amount of my memory. How, let me try to find the best approximation for that given amount of memory. These other two sketches say, well, I have a given amount of accuracy. Let me find the most compact memory representation that achieves this accuracy. So, in a way, if you, you know, look at that trade-off between you know, error and RAM, then essentially you know, lossy counting and frequent are here. And space saver is up here. Okay. So you might say, well, actually, you know, that just means I just haven't found the right parameter yet. So, you know, if I tuned that epsilon properly for lossy counting and frequent, well, I'd get the same accuracy. Well, that's not quite true. Here's why. Because basically lossy counting and frequent aggressively evict keys from its data structure when it thinks that the accuracy is, you know, that the accuracy doesn't need it. So as you observe the data stream, you might have phases where you're using very little memory even though in the end, you know, you might still go and allocate the rest of the memory. So in other words, you might have thrown too much information away in the middle, even though you had enough memory for it. So basically, these two other algorithms are oversellers in evicting information, and then in the end, it comes back to bite you. Uh, so that's why actually, you know, Space Saver is a rather more convenient algorithm to use. It also has a well predefined memory footprint. A okay. couple of research questions. One thing is, for instance, how would I go and build a distributed sketch? So each machine receives a slice of the real-time stream. And I want to actually preferably make it so that if some of the machines die, I can still ask how many times did I see this item, and I will still get a correct answer back, possibly slightly worse. The other question, obviously, is if I have more machines to process more data, this also gives me more memory. Now, I could just go and say, well, OK, I'm, I declare victory if, I don't, if my error doesn't get worse with more machines. But that's actually very stupid. Because if I have 1,000 machines, first of all, chances that all 1,000 machines die at once are not that high. Well, OK, it's not quite true if you buy a Amazon Spot instances. You can lose them all at once, right? Or if you are running on some company's machine scheduling system, and then the CEO wants to run a job, maybe your jobs get kicked out. Right? Okay, maybe not quite that, maybe not quite because of the CEO, but maybe some much higher priority job kicks you out. So it's not quite true that you only lose machines occasionally. But uh, well, if you lose all the machines, there's not much you can do anyway. anyway but uh, the point is, if you have lo a lot of machines, chances that something horribly goes wrong and you lose everything in general are lower. Now, the other thing is you have, you know, with a thousand machines, you have a thousand times as much memory. So can you actually go and design an algorithm that basically works as well as if I had a single machine with thousand times the amount of memory 
and a thousand times the processing power. So that's where, in a way, strong scaling comes in. Because, you know, strong scaling basically tells you I give you twice the number of machines, each of them with half the power. Can you still get the same performance out of this algorithm? In some cases, it turns out it's actually possible. Okay. The other thing that you might want to ask is, well, you know, this data stream comes in, and it's all very well to, to ask, you know, what are the most frequent, uh, you, know, what, what, you know, what are the heaviest users in the past month? Okay. That's what Comcast wants to know if they decide, you know, whether to overcharge you, right? Now, for a denial of service attack prevention, it's a huge difference whether I, let's say, downloaded 10 gigabytes over the past month or whether I did it over the past 10 minutes. If I'm seeing 10 gigabytes traffic over the past 10 minutes, something is awfully wrong. And I want to be able to detect it very quickly. So you want to get the temporal attributes, and you still want to compress things. And furthermore, you want to be able to make it so that very recent data has high accuracy, and data that's maybe a year ago, well, when exactly that denial of service attack happened, whether it was exactly at midnight or two hours later, I don't really care. I just want to know that it happened. Furthermore, you might also want to ask things like, you know, what are frequent item combinations? So maybe, you know, there are some events that always co-occur. So this is essentially the online version of the frequent item set uh, problem. You want to be able to detect those. So an example is, let's say you are, you know, you're receiving, let's say for instance, the Twitter uh, fire hose. So that's basically all the tweets. Or let's say you work at Twitter, okay. One thing that you might want to be able to do is pick up when some topics become really frequent, right? But you might not just care about, you know, some topic becoming frequent on all of Twitter. You might care about some topics becoming frequent in maybe Northern America, maybe in Pennsylvania, maybe in Pittsburgh, right? Or maybe it gets really popular among women, or maybe among teenagers, or maybe among people with a Windows computer. So that, for instance, might actually tell you that maybe there's a new virus on somewhere and it's posting spam on Twitter, right? So, so that kind of stuff is something you might want to know. So that's exactly where you get the combinations of attributes. You might also care about, you know, are those ads monetizing for a very specific slice of the demographic? So again, you want to get the frequent items there. And this, is, this leads to rather non-trivial algorithms overall. Okay. So these are some research questions, and if you want to know more, ask me afterwards. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. We're now going to change gears again, and basically we're going to look at semi-ring statistics, and so this is going to be more of the randomized algorithms flavor. So before that, we basically had this deterministic algorithm of you know, space saver, and I added it mainly for the reason that it's a very useful algorithm rather than that it's a 100% perfect match for this class. But it's just good to know those algorithms too such that you can combine them with the rest. Okay. So the first thing is bloom filters. Who's heard of bloom filters before? Okay. Who's used one before? Okay, good. Um, who could explain it to a friend? Well, not so many arms go up. Okay, so uh, I would expect probably about one third could, at least, maybe more. So what you might want to do is, you know, beyond heavy hitters, you might want to ask, you know, have you seen this item before? And I don't necessarily care about the true counts, but just, you know, have you seen it? So stuff like that is what effectively we exploited in estimating F0 with the Flagellima thin counter. You might want to care about, you know, getting some estimate about the frequency for all the items, but you don't really want to store the labels. 
Because one of the problems with the space saver was that you actually needed to store key value pairs. Yes, you can hash the keys, but then if at some point I want to know, you know, what corresponds to key number 529, well, you need to do a table lookup. You need to invert the hash. But maybe I can get away without any keys. And maybe I want to have some statistic that's easy to aggregate. So linear statistic of the data would be kind of nice. And furthermore, with linearity quite often come nice properties like turnstile computation. So in other words, I see some things, and then they disappear, and I want to know what I have left. So for instance, I want to know who's still in the subway, so I want to have a sketch which you know, sits at the turnstile, looks at, OK, somebody enters, he leaves again, so I don't want to count him again. And there are basically three algorithms which kind of address this. And the first one's the Bloom filter. And there are variants of Bloom filters that we'll go through. Then there's the count min sketch. And in the end, I'll briefly mention counter braids, which are a very nifty extension of the, the count min sketch. And my guess is that's about as far as we'll get today. Okay. So here's the Bloom filter. So let's say I have some bit array of length n. And the insert operation is actually very easy, right? So what I do is I take a hash function and for you know k different values in the on this diagram, k equals three, I go and set all the bits at the locations corresponding to hash of x and one, two, or three to set them to one. That's the insert operation. So that's an order k operation, and yeah, k is typically you know, in the order of 3 or whatever. For a query, I now check whether all those bits are set. And if they're all set, then I return true. Otherwise, I return false. So a very obvious thing that you can see immediately is that with this data structure, I cannot have false negatives. Right. Because the keys truly must be set for this thing to be returned. OK. So basically, if, I, if I've seen the item, I will definitely return true. But things could go wrong, because I might have accidentally set that bit in some other context. And that's when I would end up returning true, even though I haven't seen it. So I can get the false positive, but no false negatives. kind of useful. So here's, for instance, where this is useful. Let's say I want to do some expensive database lookup. Fine. Yes? Uh, if there are no collisions, then I can get false positives. Yes, that's true. So the idea is essentially, however, to allow for some collisions. Because if I didn't allow for collisions, it's a very good question. Okay. So I'm. So let's say we have n items. Um, no, let's say we have m items. And we have n bits. Now, if I didn't allow for collisions, if I didn't want to have collisions, I would actually set k equals 1. Because the fewer bits in this case, the better. And now the probability of a collision will approach order 1 if basically m is order n squared. Sorry, yeah, the other way around. So uh, m squared is order n. No, sorry, it was correct before. So in other words, I can only store order square root n distinct items in my data structure. And that's quite bad, right? So let's say, for instance, I give you maybe a gigabyte of memory. In this case, well, that's approximately 10 to the 10 bits. Not quite. It's 8 times 10 to the 9. So that would give you only 10 to the 5 items. 
In other words, you could store 100,000 items in a gigabyte of memory. That is ridiculously embarrassingly bad. Basically, any you know, dictionary would use a lot less memory than that. So basically, this would be an extremely poor use of memory. And that's exactly why you need to do something about the collisions. And this K is going to help us deal with the collisions, right? That's K. Um, so now the issue, OK, so let me give you an example way where you care about the bloom filter even if you have some false positives. Let's say I have a false positive rate of 0.1%. That's not an unreasonable thing. Now, if I have to do, let's say, a database lookup, let's say I'm, I'm running a cache. So I'm running you know, a web page cache. Then there are two things that, that this cache needs to do. If it already has the page, it needs to serve it. And if it doesn't have it, it needs to get out of the way as quickly as possible and you know, forward that traffic on. So for instance, you know, the squid proxy would do stuff like this. Now, if for every page request, it needs to look up and maintain a data structure of you know, where, that, you know, where that page is, those lookups are very expensive because it might have to hit the disk. And now comes exactly the same idea as before, basically again, you know, latency hiding. I go and have a small bloom filter that I hold in memory. And I check against the bloom filter, do I know this page? And if the bloom filter says, yes, you probably know the page, then I know that there is actually even a chance of having that page. And I go and hit you know, the storage on disk. And with some probability, I'm, it still might not be there. But I only have to hit it with a small number of requests more frequently than what I'm really doing. So even if I have to hit the disk twice as much, that's still OK, because I might have avoided a lot of other requests. So that's an example where bloom filters can really help you. They can also help you when you want to do set unions and intersections and so on, and very quickly want to estimate the size of those intersections without actually having to carry out the intersection. And I'll show you that on the next two, three slides. So basically, they are a very useful signature for sets. Um, mind you, there's just a, an HTML paper. It's probably accepted. I don't know, but at least they put it up on archive about you know, fast set kernels. And effectively, they could have just used the bloom filter and defined a kernel on that, and it would have been fine. But I, yet they're, it didn't occur to them, basically. Uh, maybe somebody has to write a blog post. OK, so let's analyze it. Um, so remember, the operations are for insert, for all the i's, set the bit to 1. And for the query, return one if it's true and otherwise not. Now, for the false positives, and this is really a back of the envelope calculation because the things aren't independent of each other. And for details, if for a slightly more refined analysis, for instance, have a look at like the review paper by Broder and Mitzenmacher, or it's also in the Mitzenmacher and Upfall probability and computing book. Both are excellent resources if you want to have a more detailed derivation. But let's just do a back of the envelope calculation. And that's essentially good enough to see what's going on here. With, you know, number of bits is large, like many millions, up to billions. OK. So the chances that a particular random bit is already set is given by 1 minus the probability that it hasn't been set yet. The probability that by, you know, if I do m insertions of k bits, the probability that, you know, it hasn't been set at any particular case is 1 minus 1 over n. Because I have n possible locations, and so 1 minus 1 over n cases, I get lucky. Unfortunately, I'm performing m, over m times k inserts, right? So while each of those events has a tiny probability, since I'm doing it m times k times, it actually adds up. And so you then just take the exponential approximation, and you get that this is 1 minus e to the minus mk over n. Right? And what you can see already here is that you have something that looks more like a ratio rather than you know, m squared over n. So this is number of inserts times number of bits that I'm actually setting for insert divided by total number of bits. 
So you can see that if you know, this quantity here is small, then that quantity is also small. And this quantity being small is, for instance, the case, you know, if I have, don't have, so basically what you want to avoid is that you have more than order number of bits distinct inserts than you did. Because then this quantity here will get large, so this gets small, so this gets large. And that's what you don't want. Small failure probability is good. Okay. Now that's for a single bit. What I want to make sure is that the probability that, you know, that at least there's one bit that will save me. Because I get a false positive if all the bits, all the k bits that I am checking, have been already set. Okay. So that's the chance for one bit. Now if I have k bits, and again this is back of the envelope because of course they're not quite independent of each other, da 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 da, and you could have, you, you would actually need to dis distinguish between cases if I'm checking the same bit twice because two hash functions map to the same point. But that's so infrequent, so you don't have to really worry about it. It's basically this quantity here raised to the power of k. OK. So that, that's the chance that something can go wrong. Now, assuming that m and n are fixed, I still have one variable that I can play with, namely the number of bits that I'm setting. And that depends on two things. It depends, first of all, on how, I, how much I care about having a small false positive probability. There's another thing that I care about in changing k. Does somebody have an idea of what else I might care about? Exactly. So it's actually less CPU time than random memory access time. Because random memory access time is about in the order of 100 nanoseconds. While maybe on slightly fancier chips, maybe you can get it in the order of 30 or 40. But between 40 and 100, that's pretty much where it's been for a long time now. Maybe on your GPU it's a bit different, but basically that's the, that's the order. So it's k times that random access time that you're really paying. So you, you don't want to have k too large, because otherwise your bloom filter gets too slow. But if it's too small, then the birthday paradox kicks in. Um, um, so, and, but then how do you know what k you used in the beginning? Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure how you could do that without knowing which words are frequent. Yeah. And for that, I would need a separate data structure that would require more memory than those bits. Um, but you're on the right track. So there's another data structure which will give you those frequency estimates. And that actually lets you blend over quite nicely between different ways of storing things in memory for <laughs> random key generations if you want to trade off, basically if you want to avoid collisions on some parts and therefore incur more collisions on other parts. So you can actually do stuff like this. Um, some of this might actually show up in the homework. Uh, but yes? Exactly. And basically, uh, uh, reducing the probability of false positives. So, how that changes the scale? So, here's what you do you take a derivative, <coughs> right? And then you set that to zero. And by squinting really hard at that derivative, you'll see that it vanishes if, if mk over n is log, log 2. So I can work out that k is n over m log 2. So there you can see that it's basically, you know, you're sort of kind of setting all the bits, right? So because mk is now a little bit less than n. And there you go. So in other words, if you have way more space than items, you should actually set a lot of bits. And if the bloom filter is getting really full, 
then, well, you actually set fewer bits, which makes sense. The problem is, of course, you know, the quality keeps on degrading as you go along, right? Because the more items, distinct items I insert, of course, you know, you'll get more collisions. So you have now two effects that will make things worse. First of all, you're running out of memory. Secondly, you have more items. Um, but that's about it. Now, the really nice thing is that you can't really do much better than that within about 45%, 44%, right? So there is no data structure that is more than 44% more effective than a bloom filter if this is the question you want to ask. So in practice, it means um, unless you have a really good reason, don't bother about inventing a better bloom filter because you won't be able to get much more. I mean, yes, if you're a theorist and you want to be able to claim that you have something that's you know, now 33% more accurate, that's probably a substantial paper. But it would have to be a very simple algorithm because basically, uh, well, any high school kid can implement a bloom filter, right? I mean, the algorithm is, that's it. It's two lines, right? OK, good. So let's look at what you can do with a bloom filter. So the first and very obvious thing is I can have two computers receiving parts of the data. And then all I need to do is to obtain a bloom filter for the union of the data is they just exchange the bloom filters and or them. That's it. And this is correct. So I can basically with that do things like I can construct bloom filters in parallel or I can also have time dependent bloom filters where I basically have snapshots and then aggregates for larger points. And the good thing is also I can use this to then estimate things like set unions and I'll show you in a moment. But basically this means that, you know, since Bitmap operations are really faster than modern CPUs. This is way faster than otherwise index manipulations. The reason why those bitmap operations are really popular and fast is because, because people like to play games and they like to watch video and listen to music. So this is why modern CPUs and also GPUs obviously and also cell phones are really heavily optimized for being able to do those vectorized operations. So if your code isn't taking advantage of this, it probably means that, well, you haven't thought very much about, you know, what your modern processor can do for you. So basically they are the SSE instructions or the AVX instructions. And I can do things like, well, you know, take a 128 bit long vector and or it with another 128 bit long vector and write it back. And essentially, processors have special hardware to do just that and do it, do it in a clock cycle. And well, basically, if you want to know details, look for something that's called the AVX instruction set. And this is basically a follow-up from the SSE instruction set. So if you've never heard of those things, you really should spend maybe half an hour at some point looking up what all operations are available. You will be amazed which things it can do efficiently. And usually I don't care about like 5 or 10% improvements. What I do care about is when all of a sudden I have a, a CPU instruction that speeds up things by a factor of 6428. Then you can probably even write a nice paper about it. Right? Because that's two orders of magnitude, people care. Okay. Now, another thing that you can do is you can estimate set intersection. Now, um, if I perform a set intersection, then it basically means the bits have to have been set in both sets. Okay. So what I can do is I can simply take two bit strings and take, you know, compute an AND and write the result back. And obviously, if an element is in both sets, the bits have to have been set in both strings, so therefore, I don't get false negatives. However, what can happen is that I have more false positives. And that depends really on, you know, how many 
extra ones there were in those strings that weren't in here. But what I can do is I can use this to, for instance, you know, estimate the sizes of, you know, unions and intersections and so on, right? So, for instance, what I can do is I can look at, you know, what's the probability that the bit is set? Well, that's the probability that the bit has been set in set one, plus the probability that it's been set in set two, minus the probability that it's in both sets, right? And then just approximating things, you get, you know, one minus e to the minus this, and then the plus the minus is cancel, of the ones cancel out, so you get this. And so obviously then, if you have this, now you look at the number of bits, you look at the number of bits in there, you can work out what these terms have to be. And this gives you a very, very cheap and fast way of estimating set unions and intersections. And this is really good if you want to do query planning, for instance, for SQL, you know, for databases. Then sometimes the order in which you apply certain operations really matters. Let's say, for instance, you want to find all female PhD students at CMU in computer science. Okay? So then, well, basically selecting very early on on women is a good idea because there are so, few, so, so many fewer women in computer science than men, right? So you drastically reduce your key set by that. Right? And it's all, on the other hand, well, there are a lot of, uh, computer science students at CMU, so maybe that's maybe not the most effective key. So, but basically, if you have a, an order in which you apply various intersections, this will tell you in which, which way to order them to get efficient uh, results. Okay, I could probably come up with a better example, or maybe you guys do, but that's about it. Um, I can do things like counts. Okay. So one of the Achilles heels of a bloom filter is that it doesn't allow for removal. Right. Because if I insert a bit, if I insert an item, I set the bit, I don't know why this bit was set. Could have been set due to five or six different things. It could have set, been set due to just one thing, right? And so now if I was to quote, remove an item, right, in the Bloom filter. So I check, is it there? Okay, that's a sanity check. I see all the bits are set. And then I remove it. Okay, let's just see what happens. Because something can go horribly wrong if I have this. Let's say, here's our Bloom filter. And for the sake of the argument, I'm only setting two bits just because well, I'm lazy. So that's, let's say, element x gets inserted, and I set those two bits. And now there's element y. And y happens to set the same bit here. And it also happens to set the bit over here. Right. So now if I was to, quote, remove x, I would end up crossing out this guy here and crossing out that guy here. And now all of a sudden my query for y will also fail. And this is obviously not good. Okay. So there's one hack that sort of kind of makes this problem a little bit less bad. It's called the counting bloom filter. So basically what we do is re we replace those bits with small integers. Okay. So if all the counters are greater than zero, I return true. Okay, that's fine. For insertion, if the query, whether it's been there, returns true, uh, okay, then yeah, that's it. Now, if I didn't, if the query didn't return true, then I go and increment all the counters by one. Now, if I then afterwards query, I just decrement the counters. So this way, at least as long as it didn't get a false positive to begin with, 
I'm not going to overcount. The problem is exactly the false positives right from the beginning because I will start introducing a little bit of error because I might say, well, I've already seen it, and then afterwards. So basically, it's a, an item comes along, it's a false positive, I perform an insert, but since I thought it's already there, I don't increment the counters, right? Then afterwards, at some point, time, uh, well, the situation is that I need to decrement the counters because I remove it, and now I create a big disaster. So let's say there's item Z, and Z goes, let's say, here and there. Now Z is colliding, and so that's basically a false positive. And, and let's say, for instance, here we had counts of 1, 2, and 1, because, well, we incremented this counter because, you know, X and Y were inserted, but Z didn't get inserted. And then once we perform remove of Z, I get the data structure that has 1, 2, and 1. And now all of a sudden, my queries for X and my queries for Y will both fail. Ah, sorry, one, two, zero, two, and zero. Okay. This is the peril of the counting bloom filter. But it doesn't happen very often, so as long as you don't perform too many removals, and as long as you don't really overfill the bloom filter, it's okay. If you want to have a nicer data structure that actually lets you do this, and still is very efficient, you need to talk to Dave Anderson. So he's come up with a very nice data structure for that very purpose. Okay. Any questions here so far? With what we're going to do now is we're going to apply this to counting. So we'll use the, the count min sketch. And if you know the Bloom filter, then you already know the data structure for the count min sketch. It's just a slight, it just looks slightly different to, you know, simplify the analysis, but there isn't much else there. Okay. So rather than a single bit array, I just store it as a matrix. And rather than bits, I'm going to use integers. So I basically take a matrix of integers. And I attach a hash function with each row. And now the algorithm goes as follows. It's basically like, really like Bloom filter, but with counters. So whenever I perform an insert, I look up in that matrix in row i, position hash sub i of x, and I increment it. Okay. And then for the query, all I do is I take the minimum of those locations and return that. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that this does support turnstile. Because if this is my insert operation, I can also just in the same way perform a remove operation. And after inserting and removing, because while well, this is a semi-ring, so hint semi-ring uh, sketches, well, I will have uh, arrived at the same result as if I'd never inserted things. Right. Because if I increment by one and decrement by one, I'm back to square zero. Back to square one. Okay, fine. Now, for the query. If you think about what happens, so each of those bins gets incremented, so each of those red guys gets incremented whenever I see X. It can also get incremented if I see something else that happens to collide. Right? However, this means that the number in here is going to be greater or equal than the number of X's that I've seen that holds for each of those red bins, right? It's just by construction. Now, that means that each of those red bins is an upper bound on the true count. So if I have a lot of upper bounds, what do you do? You take the minimum. And since each of those is an upper bound, the minimum is also still an upper bound, and this is going to give me a better behaved situation. Basically, the idea is that 
out of all those bins, sure, some of them will collide, some of them will collide with a very heavy item, but not all of them will collide with a very heavy item. And that way, you're safe. So that's the idea. Now, let's look at the basic properties. And it's like one of those really simple and beautiful ideas and you just think, well, you know, why didn't I think of this before? And it's kind of surprising that, you know, this sketch has been around only for 10 years. It could have been invented in the 60s, right? There is nothing terribly deep in there. The proof technique is so simple. There's really nothing there. So beautiful. Anyway, so we just proved the lower bound, right? So we just saw that CX is greater or equal than NX. Now, the other nice thing is that it also has a tight upper bound. Namely, with high probability, 1 minus e to the minus d, and we'll prove it in a moment, the upper bound is epsilon times F1, so basically the total number of inserts, where epsilon is just is essentially order 1 over m. It's essentially 1 over the number of bins. This is quite an improvement over other sketches, where before that, you know, we used averaging. And for averaging, we got the 1 over square root sample size type of rates. Here, we're getting a rate that goes like 1 over the amount of memory. So this is similar to what we had for the Bloom filter, right, where we also got like a fill rate that was, you know, order number of bits. Here it's the error is order number of bins, which is exactly what you want. Furthermore, for power law distributions, you get something that's even tighter. So this gets, you know, order e to the minus 1 over z, so you get even better rates. Now, basically you only need square root number of accuracy rates, so this is cool, right? You, use 10 times as much memory, and the accuracy increases by a factor of 100. The reason why this happens for power law distribution is the same as before. Namely, if I have a small number of items that are really, really heavy, then I can actually essentially ignore them for the bulk properties of my sketch. And the analysis for this actually works exactly that way, and we'll probably go through it you know, in two weeks. Namely, you disregard all the really heavy items and then you prove, you know, well-behavedness for the rest, and you bound the probability that something horrible happens and you collide with a heavy hitter. Okay. So, let's see how the proof goes. And this is exactly where we are going to use the Gauss-Markov inequality again. So, for the low bound, we already have that, right? Now, let's look at the expected value for each of the entries. So, let's look at the expected value of one of those red guys. And I'm taking the expectation over all the hash functions. Well, if you think about it, for a given bin, I get that the expected value is going to be n hat x is going to be nx. Plus, and now I have the sum over all x primes in x prime times the probability of collision. And that thing is exactly 1 over number of bins, so it's 1 over n. So I basically get that this is nx plus, so it's actually less equal than F1 over N, or M over N, right? Okay, sorry, I here assumed M bins, so just switch all that around. Okay, M, okay, here we get that. It's less equal because F1 also includes NX, so this is basically, it's N over M. So now we have a random variable. The random variable that I'm going to look at is, so z, z sub x, is defined to be n hat x minus nx. 
we know that the expected value of zx for all the hash functions is n over m. That's basically the error that I'm making. I also know that zx is greater or equal than 0. That's the first part of the inequality, right? And so I can ask, you know, what's the probability that zx is greater than e times n over m? And that's, of course, less equal than 1 over e. That's just Gauss-Markov, right? So basically, chances that any one of those rate elements exceeds, you know, it's expected that it exceeds nx by e times, you know, that ra the ratio of counts by bins is less than 1 over e. Now, for the min to return a bad result, and with bad result I mean being larger than e times n over m, I need to get unlucky d times. Basically, I need to get unlucky for each of those rows. Okay. So getting lucky e, d of those rows occurs with probability e to the minus d. So that's where we get the 1 minus e to the minus d guarantee. And so there we have it. So therefore, I know that with high probability, things are going to be good. They're going to be exponentially good in the number of hash functions. OK. So I'm going to conclude, and I have, I think, one minute left with just you know, things like heavy hitters finding. So one thing that you might, for instance, do is you know, detect heavy hitters in an IP range. And so you could just, you know, use account min sketch directly as we did it, but that's kind of wasteful if you think about it, because basically you end up getting as an error the total number of packets that your router receives. So what's much smarter is to actually, you know, if you think about those, you know, IP numbers being lined up in a tree, you basically for the leading prefix, maybe for the leading 16 bits, you keep exact counts. And then you just approximate the rest. So this way, you are dealing with much smaller numbers once you filter down the tree. Basically, you have the aggregates on top. These are exact. So, And then afterwards, you can very quickly drill down just into the rest to find things that are more frequent. Likewise, for range queries, once you line things up in a tree, you only really need to get aggregates in the, on the edges. So this way, if I have a range of length L, I really only pay log L price for that. Okay. There's not enough time to look at tail guarantees. We'll look at them in two weeks from now. Okay. Good. I'll be around for a few more minutes outside if you have questions.